classroom. And then if you want to listen to astronauts speaking in Russian, next Wednesday, you can tune in and you will be able to see us uh, with two, uh, with an astronaut and a cosmonaut. So, Sreda Pitnatstava Chisla, Sim Chisov Utram, Budit Astronaut Nicole Scott, E. Cosmonaut Gennady Padalka. So, the reason why we're doing all of these talks with astronauts is because of the Apollo Soyuz anniversary, which is the 17th of July. So, Without taking any more time, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Katie Coleman, who's going to talk about her experiences. And then you are free to ask questions in the comment box below. Ask any question you like. Damien, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and actually just so happy to be thinking back to my time our times uh, in, in Russia. My name is Katya Kolman. I am an astronaut. I live on a международная cosmic station for six months. And two years ago, 2011, maybe. It was a long time ago that I <laughs> so I don't speak uh, Russian very much anymore, but I, I really, I, I loved uh, working, living and working in Russia, mostly because I, I really loved the work that we did together. I was part of building the International Space Station and helping to organize uh, some things like, you know, just getting ready all the different countries to build the station together. Uh, one of my jobs was labeling uh, both in English and in Russian parts of the, the Russian part of the space station. Uh, and I also worked um, with everyone, both Russians, Americans, Europeans, Japanese, everyone, to make sure that all the equipment was quiet enough. And also just what were the living circumstances up on the space station. And some of my uh, best memories involve being on those kinds of teams where we tried to imagine, you know, if I was going, if you were going to the space station, what do you want to make sure you have in your cabin? Do you need a light? Do you need airflow? Do you need a computer? You know, all those things, um, people like you and, and me were designing so that now we have this space station up in space. Uh, most times we're having six people up there, three Russians and some combination of Jap Japan, Canada, Europe, and the US. And it's, it's really, it's a very special project to be a part of, and not just the astronaut part. I tell people, I think it's, um, in fact, I think it's the uh, most amazing example of international cooperation, and we have many lessons to learn from it. Uh, in fact, the International Space Station is nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize this year. And I was one of the people that made a message explaining why I thought that was true. But what I thought I would do today is uh, just show um, some pictures of the flight, but also of my time um, in Russia. And uh, I'll show you a couple of videos and hopefully you'll get to understand um, how much it meant to me to be preparing for such an important mission in the best place possible for those preparations. I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of this, this heritage. Uh, I also, and I heard Damien, Damien, I thought your Russian sounded very good myself. <laughs> and I had maybe a similar experience. My training for living on the space station happened actually very quickly like this, where suddenly in three weeks, I was told I had three weeks to learn Russian if I wanted to do that before going on survival training. And uh, so, uh, so I had to learn pretty quickly as well. I understand a lot. Sometimes I can say a lot, um, but it's, it's a beautiful language. I've been very proud of uh, knowing Russian. But let me go ahead and try to share my screen here. And let's see if we can only do that. Uh, I don't think we need sound, but I'll put it there. Okay, and are you seeing slides now, Damien? Yeah, I can yeah, see you yeah. when you nod, yeah, okay. And just let me know if there's any problems, just uh, just jump in. So uh, I've got some, some slides here of just my history in that I came to the space station via the space shuttle. 
So my first mission was a 16 day mission, literally getting ready for how are we going to do science experiments on that space station. And, uh, and so we spent, it was the at the time, the longest mission, 16 days. And I remember when we landed and when we got ready to land, I just thought, why are we going home? because we have so much work to do up here. And it's clear we're doing scientific experiments that cannot be done anywhere else. And as a former scientist, I was very proud of being um, a part of those. Let's see, here we go. Uh, so this is a uh, experience being in the space shuttle. And you know, people often ask, you know, do you like the shuttle? Do you like the Soyuz? Me, I will take any ride that is going to space. First of all, because I believe in the people that design these rockets and these vehicles. People who do these things are people who do their very best. It's dangerous work. Sometimes things happen, but I put my faith in the people that are part of this community of exploration because they are the best. They are the best people. And so, you know, it looks kind of dangerous there. It actually is. And yet um, I, I loved going to space on the space shuttle. And but mostly I will tell you my favorite mission was living up on the International Space Station. This is my second mission. Uh, it was special for two reasons. Um, in, in the picture here, I can kind of point out with my mouse, this uh, in the middle is uh, Colonel Eileen Collins. She was the first woman to command the space station. Or, sorry, the space shuttle. And uh, I'm over here on the right. And in the back here is our space shuttle. And inside the payload bay is an X-ray telescope. And what's special about that telescope, it's like the sister of the Hubble Space Telescope. There's a family of different telescopes that all look at different wavelengths of light. And uh, that telescope tells us a lot about black holes and literally everything we know about black holes comes from that telescope. And I was, uh, our crew launched that telescope and it was actually my job to be in charge of it. So it's very special to me. It was only supposed to work for five years and it's been working now for 20, which is pretty awesome. Um, but here, this is one of the most special pictures in my presentation, special to me and I hope special to you as well, because it's a photograph uh, taken to show both the shuttle and the International Space Station in one picture. And believe it or not, until our crew, Dmitry Kondratyev, Paola Nespoli from Italy and myself, until we undocked to come home, we, there was never a picture that showed both vehicles joined together in space. Because usually when we're undocking, we're on our way home and it's, uh, it's, it's complicated to redock if there's a problem. And we've never done that with the, the space shuttle presence. So our crew, um, we were the second to the last, um, we were up there with the second to the last space shuttle. So it's a very important picture. And I think to represent exactly that international cooperation that I talked about, um, because it, it's really special what we did and what we are doing but sometimes if you can't tell that story in a way that people can see and feel it, then the story can go away. And that's what I think is so valuable about these series of lectures commemorating the Apollo-Soyuz uh, um, partnership. So the space station, here's just a picture showing the whole thing. I like to make sure that people realize that we go up there in groups of three, usually one Russian and two from that US operating segment, which is made up of you know, Canada, Japan, Europe, the US. And so in this case, we were uh, an American, an Italian and a Russian, but then the next crew would be two Russians and one from that group. So we're always going back and forth and back and forth. And if essentially the balance of the station is three and three, but we arrive there, we, so up there we are six, but the way we arrive is three are there and then three more come three go home and three more come. And so we're always part of a crew of six, but they are different groups of six. And it, it, if you, some people, I'm hoping that some of you out there would like to go to space because it's more and more possible. And if you think, oh, it's not for me because it's so small, so tight. Well, on the ride up, on the taxi on the way up, Yes, that's true. But when you get up on the space station, it's very, very large. Um, here you see cosmonauts um, Sasha Misurkin in the middle, the commander of this Soyuz and also the commander up on the space station twice. And then Nikolai Tikhonov, uh, who's down there on the right. We did our survival training together when I spoke very little Russian. They spoke more English, but somehow 
First, we survived and we were known as the crew that laughed, which I'm very proud of because we really had a great morale together because the job was more important than whether we felt, you know, like we wished we had, uh, you know, could, could speak to each other in real language. We figured everything out. So the space station, I mean, we show an American football field here, but it could be a, a, you know, a British soccer field or, you know, but it, you can see it's really very, very big. And this is our crew. Um, you can see uh, Alex Kripochka on the left, Sasha Kaleri, a uh, veteran cosmonaut. And I was so lucky to fly with Sasha and to learn so much from Sasha. In the back there is, uh, is uh, um, Paola Nespoli from Italy. Um, so I'm sitting next to Dmitry Kondratyev, and then we have Scott Kelly on the right. And I think you see maybe from Dmitry's face something that was a big lesson for me. And I think a lesson, we both learned some lessons, Dmitry and I, in that he's a very serious guy. And I'm not going to say that's typical Russian, but Dmitry himself is a serious person with a serious face. And I'm a serious person with maybe not such a serious face. And we learned that we were both very, very serious about our mission. This is a short film, about one and a half minutes, just showing you, uh, this, is the, this is in Baikonur, climbing up into the rocket. You, you know, I'm sure you've seen some of these, but uh, you know, to me, it's very special to look back. We're inside that Soyuz, all together, living our dream of launching up to the space station, docking with the International Space Station. Dimitri is flying. He's the commander. It was perfect. And then we're getting down to work. And we're also, you know, we're people up there. We're learning to live. We're learning to do maintenance. We're learning what kinds of experiments we can do. You notice our kitchen table there. We're watching actually our new crew come. But we're just, we're, we're people. We're, we all bring our different hobbies. Uh, Dimitri was amazing. Dimitri actually finished a degree up there um, by correspondence. I was so impressed. And then this is what it looks like to look out of the windows from the space station, from the cupola module. Just simply breathtaking. Now, every day doesn't look like this with the Northern Lights, but maybe it depends on which, when you're there, when we were there, maybe about 10 times. And then this looks a little fast. It's, it's sped up. This film is sped up, but you see all those bright lights. Those are the lights uh, of the cities and the ground and the little sparkly lights. Those are, those are all lightning. And my, my heritage is from Ireland. My grandparents both came from there. And so I like to show that picture at the end here. But this is now another film. And let me just see, it's gonna take me a little bit just to start it. And I'm gonna jump actually to the middle right here. Right here, whoops, just a little back, I'm skipping around. Sorry about that. Let me just. Uh, Questi sono i compagni di viaggio di Paolo, che di Coleman, astronauta americana della NASA. Thank you. Just because it's worth, there's a lot of talking in this. Hold on. Just a second. Cancel. Give me just a second. That's good. Um, because it's a really, it's important uh, film. And tell me, tell me what, Damien, do you have any questions yet while I do this? I just need to make sure that uh, I did this formatting in a hurry and I just need to turn the sound off or we won't, we'll hear a lot of Italian. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a question from the American Center Moscow by Oleg. Okay. Really interested in the stars. He says, there's a lot of videos on YouTube where astronauts answer, answer the same question differently. Have you seen the stars from space? Some say, the outer space is completely dark. And then other people say that the stars look amazing. So Oleg is curious about the, the truth. Well, I think um, it's, uh, I think it's important. Um, let me just do this while I'm just looking at it right now here. Uh, there we go, one second. Okay, that should be good for our sound here. Um, so Oleg, um, I'd say you, you I mean, I, you definitely can see the stars, but you actually have to work at it a little bit in it. Um, there's a lot of light in the cabin. If you think about uh, even around your home, I mean, we have so many computers and so many things who want to be able to see them in case there's an emergency, that it actually takes some purposeful sort of putting black cloths over things to really be in enough dark to look out and see the stars. And sometimes I take the time to do that. And, and sometimes I don't, and I look out and I don't see them, you know, really quite, quite well. But when you do take that time to 
make everything look dark. It's just astonishing. Right now, there's a comet. I don't know if you've heard, but there's a comet that is passing by the, the Earth. It's called Neowise. N like Nancy, E like Echo, O, so Neo, and then Wise, like smart, W-I-S-E. Or if you just look up comet right now, you are going to find where, where and when you can see this comet. And um, they're seeing it from the space station. And so looking at some of the videos and photos, especially the Russians have taken some really beautiful photos and videos from the space station, um, you will see this comet. Okay, I think I am ready to go back to this here. Let me just do my thing. Okay, thanks for your patience. And we're gonna say share. And this, you know, I think this is my space flight training when I'm nervous, because I was nervous, like, oh, no, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, but here we go. Here's this video. And let's see, right, around here or so. So we're in Star City. And I'm going to kind of flip through this video a little bit. But this is the office at the, we call it the Profilactorium. It's a place we use for quarantine, but also there's offices there. This is Star City, where I spent usually about six weeks at a time. This is uh, myself and Paolo and Dimitri. And you see this smile on my face. I mean, I'm a real person, a regular person, just like you. And I am getting to train, you know, in a spacesuit in Star City of Russia, a, a place I've only dreamed of and has such a long history of spaceflight, of sending people to space. I mean, we have so much to learn from each other. And everyone that I met there was so generous about teaching generous about being patient with language, explaining things, understanding that I wanted to be corrected when I spoke. Um, this is Paolo in the centrifuge now. That's the centrifuge where we do some training um, to help us make sure that we're ready for space. And in fact, Paolo is actually passing a test right now um, where he is uh, making sure that he can control the centrifuge there. So now we're back in the Soyuz and just doing some of our training it's very realistic, the simulators there. And you can see all the switches and we're, you know, we're, get, we're talking, the people that are hearing us right now in, when we're in the simulator are actually instructors and we know them, they're our team. We have the same instructors often the whole time and they get to know when we're saying something as if we know something, when we're saying something as if we don't. You know, they learn to, they, they've really learned, to, they get to know us. And even, you know, making sure something simple like opening a hatch, we have to do that so that we uh, really know how to do it. Um, back in the States, we do some training in airplanes. And uh, this is Paolo and I doing uh, training in the US spacesuit. And we were, we know it's, it's a really hard job training and getting ready. And it's hard for the trainers as well. And so we become really like a family. That's our robot that we got to learn how. Um, I'm gonna skip this place, but this part, but this is pretty funny of Paolo. <laughs> I'm gonna skip along here a little bit. Let's see. Um, right here. Um, this is now the start. I want to go back just a tiny bit here. So that's us kind of getting into our spacesuits and doing spacesuit training um, in the US and some ex training for experiments here. But now we're in Star City in November. That means that we've already gone, even the launch is, the launch is not until the middle of December. We've already gone for our training and for our quarantine and most importantly for examinations. And you see on the left there that young guy, I mean, he knows everything about the Soyuz and he taught us that thing. And we are now right here, we're celebrating, uh, we're celebrating getting finished with our exams and actually passing with really great, great grades. And I'll show you a picture of our training team after this, because it was just so important to us to do this together. And now after passing those exams, we're getting ready to go to space where we're doing these traditions, we're going and we're visiting different museums. This is a little mixed up as some in Baikonur and some in Star City, but there's a great number of wonderful traditions. Now we're actually boarding the bus to get on, to get on the bus and go to Red Square. And it's a, it's a wonderful tradition to honor those who have gone before. And we're actually laying flowers for Yuri Gagarin, which really meant so much to us. It, I mean, you see, you know, all those names, you see Gagarin's name, and to be part of that family, to be part of that tradition means so much to all of us. And I think this brings us up to where the other uh, video uh, took us. Maybe we'll see just a little bit more and see where it leads us just for a minute or two, Damien, and then I'll go on to, uh, to take questions.
that is our Soyuz in December. We launched on the day after my 50th birthday. So it was a pretty exciting birthday present for me. This is some great video of docking with the International Space Station. This video was put together by an Italian uh, videographer and photographer. And this is a little bit of just like living up on the space station. We got there right before Christmas. There's a, it shows you a little bit about what it's like to live. This, we're flying through part of the Russian part of the space station where all of us, all the nations are storing a lot of equipment. And there's Paolo looking out the window at the earth, at the Japanese experiment platform. Uh, and, and do you see how just life is just plain old different? And, um, and yet, you know, it's a family and sometimes we're doing things all together. There you see Sasha Samukuchayev is helping me out there, Ron Guerin, Andrei Borisienka. We were part of their crew as well. But you can see that it's really just, uh, it's such, such a family up there. And with landing, I think I will uh, leave it at that. And let's see, I wanted to show you this picture to end. This is our training team. And I found these pictures just the other night uh, when I knew I was gonna get to talk to you. And in this picture, you see a few astronauts, myself and Paolo have our blue flight suits on from the exam. Um, and then next to us on the left, you see Dimitri. Um, behind, right next to Dimitri is a Satoshi Furukawa. And then we also have our backup crew there, um, Anatoly Ivnishin and Mike Fossum, but then also we have a lot of different people that taught us everything that we needed to, to do in order to go and have such a successful mission and accomplish such important science together. And with that, Damien, I think I will uh, stop sharing and go back to, go to questions. I might show a picture or two as we go. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We have lots and lots of questions from the American Center in Moscow. And so I'm gonna ask the question about music from Maria. She says, do you like listening to music in space? What music do you prefer? And of course, we all saw some video of you with some flutes. It's true. And um, while, we're, while I'm answering that question, I'm gonna pull up uh, really one of my most favorite slides here. If I can find it, where did it go? Usually it's here. Sometimes I don't have the music in there. Hold on just a second. Give me just a second, Damien. Okay, there we go. Um, so Maria, um, I, I like kind of a little bit of more folk music and um, which one I, I really loved uh, in Russia, um, some, of the, some of the songs because they're sort of in this A minor kind of tonality that I really appreciate. And I think it's a very lyrical kind of, it's almost like speaking, but it's music. And so I really loved uh, those kinds of songs. Um, when I was in quarantine, I played um, music with, the, with our Russian trainers. Um, and, and actually during the year, um, another astronaut, Chris Hadfield, you might've heard of him. We've played music together uh, for many, many years. And if we were in Russia training together, uh, which we were part of a backup crew together, then uh, usually at a party, we would be playing music. I, I like pretty much to play music that if anybody's playing, I just want to join in and play. It's kind of um, my um, my way of doing that. And let me just do this and this. And whoops, um, I'm seeing how many things I can do at one time here. Share the screen and you will see a very special duet. Um, and this duet is uh, a, a, a man named Ian Anderson from the group Jethro Tull. He's famous all over the world. He brought the flute to rock music, which really meant a lot to me because it meant somebody like me that liked a lot of different kinds of music could play kind of anywhere. So when I went to space, I actually brought Irish flutes and I brought Ian Anderson's flute as well. And we figured out that one thing we could do was to play a duet. And the day we chose to play this duet was when he was playing a concert in Perm, Russia, P-E-R-M, Perm, Russia. He was playing in Perm, Russia. I was living on the space on the space station, and it was April twelfth of two thousand eleven. It was the fiftieth anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's launch. So how could it be more perfect than to play a duet between Earth and space? Let me see if I can get it to go, and I think you'll be able to hear it too. You know, all these things like this music, we do them in our spare time, actually. <laughs>
thanks Colonel Catherine Coleman and the International Space Station. We should remember that today's cosmonaut scientists and astronauts are still every bit the rocket heroes they were 50 years ago. So from the cultural city of Perm in Russia, let's salute Katie, Dima and Paolo up there in orbit. And of course, the legendary Yuri Gagarin. Go safely. I really, uh, I really love, I really love that. And I loved playing music was one of the ways that I got to know people over there. And uh, I even played actually in, um, in the Metro uh, in, uh, in Moscow, I would occasionally go there and play in the Metro, not really for money. Um, and I mean, it wasn't for money. In fact, if I made money, I just, I would usually play with someone, I would just kind of come up and I would, you know, ask them and they're like, okay. And then we would have a great time. And I just, I never took the money because I really just went to meet people and play music in a place that it's wonderful to do that. Great, that's great. And I think Jethro Tull is very, very popular here in Russia. He loves uh, playing there, actually. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we have a question from Natalia. She says, thanks for your input in international space exploration. Great, great to see and listen to such wonderful Russian American team member. And she says, do you believe this sort of experience will happen again in the new technological stage? So what's the next, I guess, the evolution of uh, U.S.-Russia cooperation. Natalia, I think it's uh, it would be hard not to be doing this together. Um, I think the International Space Station and all the cooperation that has gone into that, and also the programs before. I mean, this is the week to to celebrate Apollo Soyuz, and I went to a celebration of that when um, Alexei Leonov came to the U.S. Uh, and was with Tom Stafford, who they were a crew together. They were both the commanders. And, you know, these are people that have been friends for life. And, and I find that, you know, these kinds of endeavors, there's the, you know, the countries and the leaders and all that, you know, happening up here. Um, and at the same time down here with the people, the people who really, um, not that the leaders don't have the passion, but the, you know, down here where we are the people that need to make what we're told happen. We are the people that make that happen. And you can't stop uh, collaboration in that way. And I think that we've shown with the International Space Station, we meaning all of the, there's 17 major partners, but of course the US and Russia are the sort of major partners there. Um, but all of the partners and all the participants, I mean, there's so many, um, we have shown that it's almost, you know, it's almost, it's unthinkable to do things alone, I think. Great, thanks. We have a question from Oleg, a different Oleg, uh, and it's, uh, and he asked, does any movie, full feature or documentary, render the feeling of being in space, at least to some extent? Oleg, uh, such a good question. You know, it would depend. I mean, I'll tell you what, re what, re what resonates for me. Um, I like the movie Gravity. Now, many of you are probably thinking, oh, it, there's things in there that are not true. I mean, the Chinese space station and the US and Russian space station, they're not in the same place and you couldn't do that with the fire extinguisher. For me, I'm, you know, I, I just go, well, so the physics was not so great. But what I loved about that movie is I think they let you understand what the view of the earth looks like and what it felt like to have that view. And as a person that got to go there and feel that, see that, I feel a little bit guilty being one of too few, that not enough people see that. And so I love that a movie can make it real for people and make it real, especially for our kids to feel like they can be part of this. I also, so it's, it was just really important to me. Great. Uh, Arena asks, why did you decide to become an astronaut? What attracted you most to space? Irina, um, I, I don't know how old you are, but um, I, uh, and I know you've had a long history of space in, in, in Russia, but in our history of space in the US, in the early days, it was only men that went to space. And so when I was a little girl, I would see the picture of, for example, the first seven astronauts and the jet plane that they're practicing in. And I, I really liked the airplane. But when I look at the guys, it didn't really say to me, hey, this could be you, Katie. And it wasn't until the first American woman astronaut, which is Sally Ride. Um, and so that's the first American woman uh, astronaut. Um, and, and so um, 
uh, Valentina Tereshkova, of course, is the first woman astronaut. And, and she and I actually got to have tea together before I went to the space station, which I, it, I, I treasured that so much. And she had very good advice. But back to my story, I, uh, it wasn't until I met Sally Ride, I saw a person that looked a little bit like me, you know, same color hair. And, and she was a scientist, but she also wanted some adventure. And I liked both of those roles. And the secret of becoming an astronaut is actually that no one just becomes an astronaut. Everyone else, everyone does something else first that they have a passion for, that they want to contribute. And in space exploration, we'll need all those contributions. Jian has a, a similar question. Uh, you as a female astronaut, what specific difficulties did you face during training and performing experiments? Um, what uh, specific difficulties? I would say nothing specific. You know, all of us are people that bring our strengths and that they bring our, you know, our, our weaknesses. You know, we all have things that we're good at and things that we're not good at. And what's really uh, important about a team is actually looking literally and mentally, you know, looking at your teammates and you think about what they bring to the table. And you also think about what they don't bring to the table and you help them with those things when they need that help. Sometimes they know how to ask for it. Sometimes they don't. Um, I find there's a sort of, um, maybe stereotype that a lot of times women are people who are gonna see the sort of whole big picture and are able to think about, you know, okay, we're gonna do this and this and this, but if we do it this way, then next week we have that problem. Whereas, and, that, and that's something I'm actually quite good at. Um, but looking, you know, right now and doing just this, this, this is not always something I'm good at. And together our crew made a really great crew because we had both of those dimensions. Great. We have a couple questions about space tourism and civilian space flight. If you have any thoughts, uh, when do you think civilians will be able to go to space? Or uh, do you think regular citizens uh, would be able to prepare? Uh, Elizabeth says, do you think Elizabeth, uh, do you think regular citizens are able to train and prepare for space flight? When we think about who lives here on the earth, we have all sorts of people, different kinds of people from with different backgrounds, with different skills, and any other place that we as, as a species go to live, we're going to need everybody. And everyone is going to need training to get there and to operate the, the vehicles that we'll use to get there. People can learn anything. Every, everyone could be trained. Now, there's not so many opportunities yet. There are more than, uh, than people are aware sometimes. And in fact, the Russians have been exemplary in their ability to find a way to accomplish the International Space Station mission, but also expand it to bringing some people who are civilian astronauts, so to speak. And um, often these are people who can afford to you know, make up the, the price uh, to do that. But my, my experience is that when they've had, everyone who's had this opportunity to go with the Russians and go up to the space station, they come back and they use that experience to make life here on earth better. They use it to e explain their point of view to uh, many of them have a lot of uh, resources to make sure that they're using those resources for education, that they use the fact that they're perhaps very famous in the case of Guy de la Liberté from the Cirque du Soleil. He went to space with, uh, with on the Soyuz. And he used that platform to draw everyone's awareness to the fact that here on our planet, we have uh, you know, a, a crisis for water, for clean water for everyone. And so I'm very, I think that everyone uses their ability to go to space uh, to kind of help everybody here on earth as well. And I, and I think there'll be more and more of that. There's some exciting new companies and uh, our partnership right now in, in America with the commercial space flight program, what that means is that NASA, the US space program has hired, contracted with companies like SpaceX, like Boeing, like Northrop Grumman, for different aspects of how do we keep supplies coming up and down to the space station, but also how do we keep the people coming up and down to the space station. And it makes it so we have more possibilities of doing more research, getting more work done. And on that space station, that is one of the places that we are learning the lessons that we need to learn in order to go back to the moon 
and in, and in order to go to Mars. And so more people, more opportunities, more lessons, we go further and faster. Great, I have a question from Jay and Jay would like to become an astrophysicist. And he was wondering if your attitudes towards science changed after working on the ISS, meaning that uh, experiments that used to be theoretical are now uh, real. And how, did that, how does that change science when you can take a theoretical experiment and do it in space? Do, do your attitudes change? For me, it made me in a way more hopeful uh, Jay and more appreciative. I don't know if this was Jay or not. I might've gotten the name wrong, but um, more appreciative of um, the value of science, of the fact that, I mean, the things that we look at here on earth in terms of the problems that we face, you know, all over the earth or the challenges that we face, um, it's, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy just to say, what's the answer? Oh, let's do this. I mean, there's really, these are very complicated situations with the pandemic, with climate change, with education, with enough food for everyone here on our planet. And so the fact that we can go to a different environment and find out things we never could before is really encouraging to me. Great. Uh We've got a question from Grigori, and he asks, uh, what was and still remains your most important feeling or impression from being at the International Space Station that maybe changed your comprehension or influenced your mind? My, my prevailing sort of feeling or impression or what I think of when I close my eyes and think about what it meant to me to be there is that looking back at the Earth, I mean, everyone is here. Everyone except the six of us is back on earth. And that means that, you know, together on earth, we are a crew. We are the crew of spaceship earth. And from our point of view, you know, being the six people that are looking, looking back, you know, we see that everyone is there. And if they only knew about each other and could find each other, well, I think we could solve anything. And so realizing that we're all connected and that we're all part of the team of Spaceship Earth, the crew, that was really encouraging to me. Great, that's wonderful. Tammy has a question. She wants to know what type of fitness training you do and other astronauts to prepare for time in space. And I think you also do exercises while you're in space too. We, we do. And um, uh, and you know, I could just actually show a little video while I'm just describing that. Let's see, I'll just share my screen. We'll sort of do it a little bit, uh, a little bit sloppy. You'll see some of my slides here. Oops, one second. Uh, let's see, find my little picture that I love. <laughs> a lot of uh, every time you answer we have a lot of people saying thank you for your answer <laughs> let's see let me just do this now are you seeing that screen not quite right yeah you're yeah. not are you seeing the video not quite right oh not no nope here we go okay i should realize that i can't really do this at the same time so this is a little video. Um, you asked about exercising. Here's Mike on the treadmill. So we work out. Uh, this is up in space. I'll cover that first so up in space. Uh, we work out on the treadmill. We have a bicycle. We have several with a there's one in the Russian segment. There's a treadmill and a bike in the Russian segment and also in the US segment and also a weightlifting machine. Um, the, of course, everything is weightless, but there's some resistance there. Um, you're seeing Mike in his cabin. This is just a few, it's not just about exercise, but a few little aspects of, of living and working in space and what it looks like to repair things, things like that. But exercise we do about, um, uh, we do about, that's uh, uh, Ser uh, Sergei Volkov, you just saw, whose father is a cosmonaut as well. Um, and so doing exercise up there, we, and there's Sergei on the bottom left that you see there, and Sergei's right here. He was a wonderful guy to work with. He was the, he's not on my mission, but he was the chief cosmonaut for um, a while. And so we, we knew each other then. 
but and this is actually I just have to stop my answer and just let you see this about sports on the space station. Now Satoshi's from Japan, and he loves baseball, but everyone is busy doing work, maybe sleeping. But we all get time to have a break. And what Satoshi loved to do was play baseball. But he has to be the whole team. He has to be the pitcher and the batter and the outfielder. <laughs> and you'll see a little bit about fun here. But you have to have this kind of fun because we actually do work really, really hard up there. And part of the thing that makes it difficult up there is that we do have to exercise about an hour and a half a day up there. So we're doing about a half an hour of uh, cardio in about, and this is uh, eating in the Russian segment there, an hour and a half of cardio and an hour and a half, or in, in sorry, a half an hour of cardio and an hour of weightlifting. Okay, and let's see, well, they're great guys. Um, so we, we do a lot of exercise up there and to get ready, I basically believe in, you know, if you have this job that everybody would like to have this job, but I have this job, then it's my job to do my very best to be ready. And that meant working out and be, in being in the best shape that I could so that, you know, I'm not tired at the times when I might really have to work hard or, or do something in an emergency or, you know, those kinds of things. And so I was in really, really good shape when I left. And then by exercising an hour and a half every day on the space station, I was in really good shape when I got home. Great, those are great videos. Uh, Alex wants to know, how did you feel when you first saw planet Earth from space and what does a launch feel like? Ooh, Alex. Um, well, I'll just start with launch. Um, it's really hard, I think, as a person, as a real person to think that you're gonna actually get to go to space. And so when it happens, when you're laying on your back, you know, back in your back, you're in the capsule, you're laying on your back and those engines light and there's just this immense and amazing force. And it's not that you're going so fast right then, but it's, you just realize there's so much power behind you that it's relentless and that you are just going to go and go and go until you cannot go any further. And it was really, amazing to be part of that. The launch takes about eight and a half minutes. Now on our Soyuz mission, and the Soyuz is a smaller vehicle than the space shuttle. And what that means is it it's literally that you sort of strap on a Soyuz. You don't climb in and get strapped in, but it's almost like you are putting on that spaceship on a launch pad and then you are launched into space. And then by the time we get in orbit, now it's just our little tiny Soyuz, no rocket, but just the Soyuz. And it was back in the days when we would spend about a day and a half making sure that all the systems were ready for docking with the International Space Station. And so Paolo and Dimitri and I spent two days just orbiting the earth in our tiny, it's the size of a smart car, our little part of the Soyuz. And getting to do that and just be us and the earth was, simply amazing. And it reminded me of the history of what's gone on before, the history in the Russian space program and in our space program of the Apollo, Gemini, and Mercury for the, for the US um, and, and all the many early space flights for the Russians. And to realize that you're part of that same family, it's really special. Great. Uh, Timur wants to know about uh... What's the difference between life on Earth and life in space? And Masha wants to know what kind of food you eat during the mission. <laughs> well, I really love the uh, being weightless part of living up there, where it's not about floating around. It's about flying from place to place. You just need a tiny little push, and then you're going. And it's just a magical way to live. And as for food, that same weightlessness makes it actually very fun to uh, to be um, playing with your um, with your food, and so um, it's really fun to. I mean, it's a little messy sometimes, but uh, we eat all sorts of you know for Americans kind of regular meals, and but also you know we ate uh, Russian food as well, and um, we 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 uh, on our side we had actually a little bit more steak and chicken. And I am not a steak and chicken person. And so I would actually trade my steak and chicken for borscht when I was up there. And the, the Russians also had bread. It was like these little tiny 
bits of bread, like little tiny loaves of bread. They were so cute and they tasted so good and wonderful uh, plof, where it's, it's rice and, and vegetables and meat. So I loved the Russian food up there too. Great, great. Uh, Alexander wants to know about calling your family. Can you call your family from space? How does that work? We, we use an internet, internet protocol phone and we can call them if we wanted to, we could call them you know, 40 minutes of every hour, but there's not really time to do that. But we talked, in my family, we talked, I would say every day, except for about three of the six months that I was up there. Uh, and, we, and we would get video, you know, I think we're all a little bit spoiled with Zoom and everything, but we would get video one time a week with our family. And uh, we've got a question from uh, Arena, which is very timely. Why is cooperation in space so important? And I don't know, she doesn't say whether it's international cooperation or just in general, so you can interpret it however you want. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go for international and just say that, you know, we're all from the same place. And, you know, what, one of my impressions was, I always thought that, you know, here's the earth and then space is somewhere else. But then being up there, you realize that Earth and the place that we live is just bigger than we thought, and it includes space. And so we're all here on Earth. Of course, we're going to all be up in space together as well. And I think that we can all be extremely proud of our countries in the way that we have uh, become an international space station. And even in, in times of trouble, in times of disagreement between our countries uh, themselves, always the International Space Station is an icon that is untouchable. Business as usual, the business of the planet of exploring space goes on with Americans and Russians going back and forth and doing what we need to do for training, getting ready and flying together on the space station. I'm very proud of that. Great, great, that's great. Uh, Anna wants to know how astronauts shower. Anna, I have both good and bad news for you. We don't, but <laughs> that's the bad news. And I did miss it, um, but you know, I'm not gonna have one, so I don't worry about it. And we could have a shower. I mean, we could have a place like our cabin. We could have water coming from a pipe, pressure. We could take a shower, but then we would have to clean up afterwards and dry everything off so it stayed very clean and not moldy. And I think that all the astronauts and cosmonauts have taken, uh, is, have made decisions together saying, would you like to use this space for living and for experiments or would you like to use it for a shower? So we don't have a shower by choice. Um, it is nice to take one when you get home. But in the meantime, uh, we just take a sponge bath and it's very, very possible to do just like you might in a hospital if you were sick. We take a washcloth and, and actually the Russians had the best towels where we call them the Russian wet towels. And you can ask anyone about this. And they're, it's kind of cloth, but it's like linen a little bit. It's a little bit scratchy and it would have some soap on there. And then you take them and you're going scrub, scrub. And everyone loved the Russian wet towels. And in fact, I would open a package and I would only cut off a little piece, put the thing back in the package. And then, you know, and you have to use it actually over about a week because then otherwise it would get kind of yucky, but they were treasured, the Russian wet towels. Great. So you like the Russian towels and the Russian borscht better than the American. Definitely. And I think you ask any astronaut. And in fact, I don't know if they've recreated the Russian wet towels, but um, I, I think they, they were trying and they were never the same. Everybody would come back and go, nope. <laughs> so we've got a lot of people who have said that they want to become astronauts. Uh, some of them, most of them are 15 years old. Uh, what advice would you give to these young people who want to become astronauts? How, what can they do to start training right now? To start training right now is, is just to begin, and I'm, I'm sure you already are if you're asking this question, is just, you know, work hard in school. Work hard in all aspects of school. Um, math and science, yes, very important, but also reading and writing and being able to tell the story of excuse me, the things that you're getting to do, but just being in school and being open to learning everything. And when an, when an adult says to you, what would you like to do when you're grown up? Or what, what, what are you planning to do for work? 
try to ignore that question because you have a lot to discover about yourselves about the skills that you have, about what might be important to you. And when you find things that you think are important to you to learn, that you feel passionate about doing, well, do them. And realize that we are gonna have, we are gonna need everyone as we explore further in the universe. And so finding the, the if you pick the things that you are passionate about, you will be better at those. And as we evolve, more and more people will be becoming astronauts. And you know, if you, I think science and math for everyone, because look at the, look at the pandemic, look at reading the newspaper, understanding what's going on. It's hard. It's hard for me. And I'm a scientist to understand, you know, is this written? Is it, does it really, you know, how, what does this really mean for me and my family? Should we do this? Should we do that? And so the more you can train yourself to be able to read and make your own sort of judgments and talk about it with people, the better off we're all going to be for solving the world's challenges. We'll do one or two more questions. A number of people have asked about technology. Mm -hmm. If you know of any new technology that's coming, but if you, that will improve space exploration. But if you don't know for sure, are there certain technologies that you believe are important for our missions to the moon and Mars? Well, I'll answer your question in kind of a different way. What's exciting, I think, about space is the fact that the technologies that we need up there, and because it's for space, people are like, oh, I want to do that. I want to figure out how to recycle the air on the space station. I want to figure out how to recycle the water on the space station. Oh, learning how to grow food for those astronauts, let's do it. People are very excited about the fact that, I mean, space is important to all of us all around the globe and it drives an interest in solving those problems but the really i think important thing is to realize that those things i just mentioned recycling air recycling water growing food in places it's hard to do that they are exactly applicable to many places here on earth where it is hard to do that even you know developing communication mechanisms so that we can be in touch with the, with the space station and communicate back and forth. Well, that's important right now, now that the world has had to be more isolated. So all these problems that we solve for space, they're really important Earth solutions as well. Great, wonderful. I'm gonna do a quick plug for Monday's talk with Marsha, and then I'm going to come back, uh, Katie, and, and give you the floor for some last words of advice okay. uh, for the Russian people. So if you enjoyed this talk, uh, please join us on Monday. We have astronaut Marsha Ivins, who will be uh, on this exact same platform uh, on the US Embassy Facebook page and the American Center Moscow Facebook page. And she'll be giving a talk about the history of the space shuttle. So uh, she has a lot of experience and a lot of close connection with this incredible vehicle that uh, the United States operated for 30 years. And so she's gonna talk about that and you can ask her questions. So that is on Monday, uh, Nicole Scott i Gennady Padalka i oni vmesti budet sabšit сделала презентация точно так, как сегодняшние мероприятия, но это будет полностью на русском языке. So you are invited to Monday's talk and Wednesday's talk. Uh, Wednesday is the 15th, and that talk will be at 7 o'clock. Значит, не, не 6 часов, а в среду будет 7 часов. So we will see you on Monday, and we will see you all on Wednesday the 15th. So we had a lot of great questions and I'm going to hand it back uh, to Katie, who has so many wonderful things to say about Russia and so had such a great experience working with the Russians. Thank you so much for sharing your photos and your videos and your life experience and your emotions uh, and your feelings. So uh, 
what uh, feel free to uh, give any last words or comments uh, to all of the the people here in Russia um, on this 45th anniversary of Apollo Soyuz and 25th anniversary, of course, of Shuttle Mir. Well, Damien, thank you. And I have really loved this opportunity to think back uh, and, and really remember and look at pictures and see faces. And it meant so much to me to train together um, for this mission. And, and I, I just really, uh, I, I loved so many parts of it. So it was nice to look back. I have to actually also tell you, um, come next week, I am gonna actually watch Marsha and Nicole and Gennady. Now, Marsha, I mean, Marsha is an extraordinary, interesting, fascinating person. And every single, every single image I showed today, um, Marsha is behind every camera that we had on the space shuttle, on the space station. I mean, she's this sort of like kind of small, tiny person who is, the, the photos will be, I, I tell you, amazing. She's an amazing photographer. All of the IMAX movies that you've seen. And, and, it's, and it's a lesson really in how one person makes a difference where she really found a way to say, this is what crew members are gonna be able to do and use. And we need cameras like this. And we're gonna see things like that. We need to be able to capture them. These astronauts can learn, but literally uh, so many things on the space station, everything to do with photography, but even how we live up there, how we pack things so that they're not just opening a suitcase and having them come out. I mean, Marsha is simply amazing. And Nicole Stott is a very good friend. I was her backup for her mission. So I know Gennady as well. And they were the part of the first six person crew. Nicole was the first person ever to capture a supply ship coming, uh, coming from earth up to the space station, capturing it with the robotic arm. It's a big, big deal because it's not just like a spaceship and a supply ship, both kind of about the size of train cars. No, it's a big, the space station's like a big factory. I mean, it's huge. And then a truck is coming to the factory. Well, what if it's gonna crash? You can't move the big factory. And so as a very critical operation, Nicole is amazing. And the, the partnership that she and Gennady and their crew had as the first crew of six on the space station is really something to learn about. And she's a good friend. So don't miss those or any of these. And I think I'm gonna be tuning in from the US as well. So thank you for having me today. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye and thanks.